Yes. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am indeed going to talk to you about crack growth in adhesion bonds. But before I talk about that, I want to ask you a different question. That is, what will happen if I drop this pen? It falls, of course, and we know that. But how fast does it fall? How long does it take to hit the ground? And does it matter if I drop it from here, or here, or from some different height? Again, it's a question we already know the answer to. But let's pretend for a second we don't. Let's try and solve this question the same way we solve questions in fatigue crack growth at the moment. So what do we do? We take the pen and we drop it from different heights, and we measure how long does it take to hit the ground. Well, I can do that. We get this nice graph, so okay, looks good. We might be able to do something with that. And of course, we plot it on a log log scale, because things always look better if you plot them on a log log scale. We get this graph. Okay, so looking better, it looks like quite a nice straight line, so we can fit a line through there. And then indeed, we get this very nice correlation. Right, a very nice parallel function fitting through the data, uh, which has a nice coefficient and an exponent, around about half. And then we can predict how long it will take for the pin to hit the ground. So, job done, can all done, right? But, hang on a second. Why is this exponent a half? What does it mean? This coefficient here, why is that there? What does it mean? Does it depend on the mass of the pen, or the shape of the pen, or on the properties of the air? All of those questions we can't answer. We could say, okay, we can predict how long the pen will fall. But anything else, we don't really understand. To really understand what's going on, we need to go a step further, or actually approach a problem from a different angle, by looking at the physics. Right? Why do we get that curve fit? Well, if we go back to the equations of motion, then we know that if we start from rest and we have a certain acceleration, the time, uh, sorry, the distance <coughs> we cover is one half times acceleration times the time squared. We do some algebra, solve for time, and then we get that the time it takes to fall from a certain height is the square root of 2 over g times h to the power of half. Right? Purely from the physics that we know of the problem. And then we can start comparing things. We say, hey, here we have a half, here we have well, something close to a half. Looks good. And we're about to 0.404. Well, if we work out the square root 2 over g term, then we get something quite close to 0.404. So now we can understand this equation. We say, OK, this term here gives us information about, depends on the gravity, right? the uh, gravitational acceleration. And this half, that comes from the fact that in the end we have to integrate acceleration twice to get position. So to really understand what's going on, we can't just do experiments and correlations. We have to think about the physics. And the same thing we need to start doing in fatigue. right? We do lots of correlations. We have all kinds of different functions at work to predict. But we don't really understand what's going on. And that's why I'm the said, okay, it's Take a step back, forget about predictions for a while, and try to really think about the physics of what's going on. If we start off with kind of a conceptual model, we say, well, where can we start off? What do we know about the physics? Well, we can start with Griffith. Griffith said, to grow a crack, we need to provide a certain amount of energy. There's a certain amount of energy required per unit of crack growth. So it's over there. And of course, when we apply a load to a specimen, we are putting energy into that specimen, so there's a certain amount of energy available. So it's over there, and then the combination of the available energy and the required energy gives us the crack growth per cycle. And now both the available and the required energy, and I'll show some evidence for that in a minute, both depend on the applied <coughs> load. Okay? So we did some experiments to test this model. So basically, just really simple fatigue tests. Mode 1, double count UV beam specimens. Aluminium to aluminium with an uh, epoxy adhesive to make an adhesive bond. Mode 1 opening on the displacement control uh, at 5 hertz. And then what you can do is, when you do the test, the specimens are linear elastic. So if you draw the force displacement line, you get this line. And the area under that line is, of course, the energy of the system. Right. So we have here the 
uh, load cycle we're applying. So this energy gets cycled in and out every time. So it's the cyclic work we're applying. You cyclic. We have an amount of energy we put in at the start, and then it remains in the specimen until the end of the test. If nothing else happens, we call it human atomic, and you can sum them, and we have the total energy in the system. And then if you look at that energy, over the course of the test, as the crack gets longer and the specimen gets less stiff, because we're on displacement control, the amount of energy in the system goes down. Right? Then you can fit the curve through that, take the derivative, and then we get du dn the strain energy dissipation per cycle, right? So in any cycle during my fatigue test, I can find, find how much energy was dissipated in that cycle. I also know what the crack growth in the cycle was, just purely by crack growth measurements in standard way. And then we can plot those against each other. Then we get this. So whether we look against the dissipation of purely the cyclic energy, so just this portion, or the dissipation of the total energy, you get a nice narrow band of all the curves lining up, even for different R ratios, they all line up along one line. So there's a very strong correlation indeed, as you would expect, between the energy dissipation and the crack growth rate. What's interesting about this is that this exponent is not equal to one. It's about 0.86 in our experiments, but the main point is it is not equal to 1. Why is that important? Well, if it's not equal to 1, it means that the amount of energy I need per unit of crack growth is not constant during the test. Right? With higher crack growth rates and higher energy dissipation rates, I'm dissipating more energy per unit of crack growth than at low crack growth rates. So something is changing during the test. And there's a way of quantifying that. We came up with the parameter G star, which is the amount of energy dissipated in one cycle divided by the crack growth rate in that same cycle. So that is the average energy dissipation per unit of crack growth in the cycle. Right? That is an average strain energy release rate. You could think of it that way. But it is not the mean value of the applied strain energy release rate. And that you can use to quantify the resistance to crack growth, right? If it mo takes more energy to grow a unit of crack, then the resistance, so to speak, is higher. So let's talk a bit more into detail on that by looking at one single value of crack growth rate. So we took all the experiments we did, and we looked for 10 to the minus 4 millimeters per cycle crack growth. And then what you see is that for each experiment, the amount of energy that was dissipated to create that amount of crack growth was different. <coughs> right. So even though the crack growth rate was the exact same at all these points in each experiment, the amount of energy dissipation was different. So the resistance was different. In this case, we talk only 7.5 times 10 to the minus 4-ish millijoules to create that amount of crack growth. In this case, almost two times 10 to the minus third. And then you can ask, well, what is then causing that? We haven't worked out, unfortunately, uh, how it exactly works, but we have seen there is a very strong linear correlation with Gmax. The higher Gmax, the more energy that is required to uh, create the same amount of crack growth. Right? So this is the resistance part. Apparently that is determined by Gmax. And if we want to know how much crack growth we actually get, then we also need to think about how much energy we have available. So we did kind of the same trick. We said, well, now let's look at one fixed resistance value. So we took all the test data and then looked for the points in the test where we had a resistance of 0.7 millijoules per square millimeter. Right? So 0.7 millijoules to create one unit of crack growth. We then find is that the energy dissipation for all those resistance values is very different. So the total amount of energy dissipated in one cycle <coughs> varies by almost two orders of magnitude. Now the resistance, so the amount of energy per unit of crack growth for all these experiments was the same. So if the total energy dissipated in a cycle is different, also the amount of crack growth in the cycle is different. Right? So this is really representing how much energy we have available for crack growth. We require the same amount in each case, and so on. 
And then we found that this energy available is very strongly correlated to either delta square root g, which is roughly equivalent to delta k, uh, or to the cyclic energy, so the, really the work we are applying in each load cycle. Again, we haven't figured out yet how this works, but we think it gives us some clues as to where we need to start looking. So, to summarize, we can characterize fatigue crack growth by means of the energy dissipation. We can measure the energy dissipation, measure the crack growth rate that matches with that, and use that to kind of characterize what is going on in our material. Not predict, but characterize, and thereby hopefully understand. We've seen that there is a resistance to crack growth that we can quantify, and that is correlated to G max, the maximum scale energy release rate. And we've seen that the amount of energy available for crack growth can be correlated to either delta square root G or to the cyclic work we are applying. Now, I know this was a lot of information, so uh, do feel free to come find me in the coffee break if you want to discuss it further. Uh, or you can contact me at j.a.pasco at tudelf.nl. If you don't believe a word of what I said and want to check the data yourself, uh, you can find it at data.4tu.nl. Also, if you want to use it for any other project, if you have some model you want to validate or something, please feel free to find our data and make use of it. And in conclusion, I hope that this presentation, brief as it was, has inspired you to next time you're doing a fatigue crack growth experiment, to not just look for correlations, but to have a sit, have a think, what does it actually mean? Thank you.